So this week's Torah portion is Vayetse, and he went out. Um, let's recap what happened last week. Jacob, the birthright, the stealing of blessings, and uh, Jacob's father has sent Jacob out and says, go get a wife from Abraham's family. So just so that we you know recap where we were so you, you've had this whole mess of Esau wanting to kill Jacob and Jacob's basically been forced to flee so this is the context that we pick up in in this Torah portion Genesis 28 verse 10 and Yaakov went from Be'er Sheva and went to Haram so we just said this Yaakov was actually forced to flee without any possessions literally just the clothes on his back go He leaves with his blessings and the birthright, but with absolutely nothing to show for it, which is a bit of a a, a juxtaposition. He was the chosen son, yet was forced to flee to the the land of promise. He's the one that's having to go, which is interesting because when Yishmael was rejected from the birthright, it was him that had to leave. And this is actually in stark contrast to Yaakov. So he must be thinking, okay, yes, he'd know that he brought this upon himself but at the same time he's like hang on I'm the son of promise I'm the one being forced to flee the land I've got a birthright but I've got nothing to show for it it would have been quite discouraging for him and he came upon a place and stopped over for the night for the sun had set and he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep what do people notice about that sentence there's an emphasis something's been repeated that place it just says that place it makes a point of emphasizing that place why this is a quote by the way um the road that jacob took from Be'er Sheva was not the easy way to haram the easy way was the king's highway that follows the jordan river valley instead jacob took the ridge road that follows the ridge of hills that make up the center of the land of israel In the center of that ridge was the town of Shalem, or Jebu, which is Jerusalem. And very close to that was the town that is identified as Bethel, or Beit El, the house of El. The ancient sages identified Beit El not with the later Bethel in time of the judges and the kings, but with Arona, the Jebusite's threshing floor, which Jacob's descendant, King David, purchased for for the purpose of building a temple to Hashem. If this is true... Jacob's first encounter with the God of Abraham and Isaac was on the site of Abraham and Isaac's greatest test, the offering of Isaac on the mountains of Moriah and the place of our master's suffering and resurrection. So that you've got, I believe this is why it's that place, that place. Assuming this is the same location, the stone that Yaakov used as a pillow, we're going to read this, well, we read it, may very well have been from the altar that Abraham offered Yitzhak upon, or from thereabouts, which is really interesting. So you have this like father, like son sort of thing going on. People are, you know, cyclical things going on. Now, the word place is makom. There's the Strong's reference. The root of which is kum. Now, this word kum has some interesting allusions to arise, to become powerful, um, to be proven, to be fulfilled. If you go to the second column, to confirm, to ratify, establish, impose, to raise up. What I'm saying is that in this word, there's an implication of resurrection, to arise. And what did Yeshua do when he arose from the dead? Well, he definitely confirmed a few things, he ratified a few things. He established a new, he established the regathering of the exiles. I'm just saying that in this place where the temple would be built, where Isaac was offered on, and already we saw that the story of Isaac being bound was a type and shadow of resurrection. And I believe that the word kum is alluding to that as well, which I thought was interesting. So let's go back to the Torah portion. And he lay down to sleep. And he dreamed and saw a ladder sat set upon the earth and its top reached to the heavens and saw messengers of Elohim going up and going up and coming down on it and see Yah stood above it and said I am Yah of Elohim of your of Abraham your father and the Elohim of Yitzhak and the land on which you are lying I give it to you and your seed 
Now, we have some interesting connections with the word ladder if we look at its gematria. Gematria is numerical values. Um, now, I'm not basing doctrine. Before you go, ah, there's just interesting allusions. Um, if you take the word ladder, sulam, this, this is your numerical values of the letters. Now, other words, Sinai, Sinai, has the same numerical value. If you, so, I, I'm, I'm going to make a point. Moed, as in the Moedim, the appointed times, these, have, it, they, they all have the same numerical value of 130. So we have the ladder going between heaven and earth. We have Sinai. What happened at Sinai? Well, there was definitely a bridge between heaven and earth, you could say. The Moedim, you meet with divinity. You meet with Yah, you meet with one another. So three times a year, Israel is commanded to meet at a particular place, Akum, to meet with Yah. Yah met with his people at Sinai. He also met with them at the tent of meeting. Now, who knows what the Hebrew is for the tent of meeting? No, the tent of meeting. So this would be... It's the tent of Moed. If you look at the Hebrew, the tablet, you've got the tent Moed. You can look in the Hebrew for yourself. Uh, I discovered this when doing a word study on Moed. Uh, looking at the feasts originally, and I realised, hang on a minute, the tent of meeting, uh, it's also called the tent of appointment in the King James, maybe. What's an appointment? It's a Moedim. There's all these interesting allusions. You went, you went to the tent to meet with Yah. The dream of the ladder is a picture of Yah setting up a line of communication between heaven and earth. Now, that's what the tabernacle was for, the tent of meeting. When That's what the feasts are about. You go there to meet with Yah. There's this connection between Yah and his people. Now, John 1, Yeshua says something very interesting. In verse 47, Yeshua saw Nathanael, so Nathanael, coming toward him and said to him, See truly a Yisraelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, From where do you know me? Yeshua answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of Elohim. You are the sovereign of Israel." Yeshua answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Greater than that you shall see. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, from now you shall see the heaven opened and the messengers of Elohim ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. <coughs> this is a direct reference to Jacob's ladder where he saw the heavens open and there was a ladder with angels descending up and down on it. And you sure is saying that he is that connection, which should bring up some interesting scriptures. Uh, we see that it is through Yeshua that we have access to the heavenlies. In John 10, verse 7, we know this. Yeshua therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and shall go out and find pasture. In John 14, Yeshua said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is that ladder to the heavenlies. In Hebrews 10, verse 19, So, brothers, having boldness to enter into the set-apart place by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way which he instituted for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of Elohim, let us draw near with a true heart in completeness of belief, having our hearts sprinkled from a wicked conscience and our bodies washed with clean water. The writer of Hebrews is essentially... The whole point of Hebrews was that he was an atonement and it's through that that we can actually draw into the temple, the heavenly temple. Not the Holy of Holies, the holy place. There's a difference, but that's another discussion. Let us hold fast the confession of our expectation without yielding, for he who promised is trustworthy. Endure until the end. So let's go back. If people connected the dots, Yeshua has basically said that he was the ladder. And... The, the writers of Hebrews and several places say that it's through him that we have access. And see, Yah, so let's go back to the, uh, the vision. And see, Yah stood above it and said, I am Yah Elohim, 
of Avraham, your father, and the Elohim of Yitzhak, the land on which you are lying, I give it to your seed. This is actually now the first time that uh, Yaakov gets it directly from Yah, the promise. Because up until this point, it was always given, it was uh, from his father. He, his father says, I give you the blessing of Abraham. Now it's Yah confirming it. First time Jacob gets it. And to your seed, and your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall break forth to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the clans of the earth shall be blessed in you and your seed. And see, I am with you and shall guard you wherever you go and shall bring you back to this land. For I am not going to leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So we have Yah confirming the blessing of Abraham with Yaakov. We also have a prophecy of the dispersion and the regathering within this promise. I don't know if you guys caught it. Um, I've highlighted it. You shall break forth to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And then he says, and I shall bring you back. Now you could say, yeah, they're just going to spread out and be multiple. But we're going to see that these statements to the west, to the east, um, also and being brought back. We're going to see that this is used in the prophets in terms of the regathering of the lost tribes. In Isaiah 11, we know this. It shall be in that day that Yah sets his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Ashur and from Mitzrayim, from Pathros and from Cush, from Elam and from Shinar, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall raise a banner for the nations and gather the outcasts of Israel and assemble the dispersed of Yehudah from the four corners of the earth. Uh, so you've got both the outcasts of Israel and the dispersed of Yehudah. Just throwing that out there. Um, Isaiah 43, we get this theme again. Do not fear with you, for I am with you. I shall bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. We have this east and west thing going on again. I shall say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. So all those who are called by my name, whom I have created, formed, even for my esteem. So actually, that's why we're even here. We were created for his honour, for his glory. Um, now, the four cardinal points, north, south, east and west, are equated to the ends of the earth. Let, where else do we see this ends of the earth? Acts chapter 1. So when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Master, would you at this time restore the reign to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know what the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the set apart spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Yehudah and Shamaron and to the ends of the earth. This was what was the gospel, the good news. You can come back. You are now back in covenant. This was the starting point of the regathering. Pardon? <laughs> Tell me later. That <laughs> um, Back to the Pasha. And Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, Truly, Yah is in this place. I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of Elohim, and this is the gate of the heavens. Yaakov calling this the house of Elohim is hugely prophetic, as this would be where Solomon's temple would be built, as this was the plot of land David bought. Uh, now bear in mind, when he said this, there was no house there. It was just a place, wasn't it? At best there was an altar. So he's saying, this is the house of Elohim, there's no house there. Just... Yeah. And Yaakov rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put his head, set it up as a standing column and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of the place Beit El, House of El. However, the name of that city had been Luz previously. Now, if this is the place that the temple would be built, the stone that Yaakov set in place is essentially a type and shadow of the cornerstone. 
Do we know that uh, for a temple to be operational, all you needed was the altar and the cornerstone, and then the temple service could start. You could do the daily sacrifices, basically. That's what happened in Ezra, in Nehemiah's day. They had the altar, the cornerstone. This, the temple wasn't finished when they were doing the temple duties. And he called the name of the place, but however, the name of that city had been Luz previously. City, it's town. If this is the anointed cornerstone, he anointed it, that the whole house of Elohim would be built upon. And people see what I'm trying to get. Who is the cornerstone? Yeshua. What does Mashiach mean? Anointed one. So with that in mind, Ephesians 2.13, but now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. This is regathering talk, by the way. This is about to the lost tribes. Because through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Again, this idea that Yeshua is the ladder. He's the bridge point between us and heaven. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the set-apart ones and members of the household of Elohim, the house of El, Beit El, having been built upon the foundation of the emissaries and the prophets, Yeshua Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone. So this is, he's speaking spiritually. Right now, we are part of the house of Elohim and our, our cornerstone should be Yeshua. I hope it is. He keeps going, in whom all the building being joined together grows into a set apart dwelling place in Yah, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of Elohim in the spirit. So let's go back. I, I, when I saw this connection, I was like, wow, that's just incredible. Like, even in the, like, the symbolic acts, like these prophetic things that have massive implications. And Yaakov made a vow, saying, Seeing Elohim is with me, and has kept me in this day that I am going, and has given me bread to eat and a garment to put on. When I have returned to my father's house in peace, and Yah has been my Elohim, then this stone, which I have set as a standing column, shall be Elohim's house, and of all that you give me, I shall certainly give a tent to. He's literally saying, this will be the dwelling place of Elohim. And that... Okay, was this fulfilled? Literally. It was. The temple was built there. And what did Israel do? What, what, what was Jacob's name later on? We'll find this out. His name was changed to Yisrael. So, prophetically, this is when Yisrael came to the land, they built the temple. Jacob, in spirit, was giving tithes in that place. Will it be fulfilled again? <laughs> Well, it's not a trick question. The answer is yes. In Ezekiel 20, because we know there's going to be temple, uh, temple service again in the millennium. Part of that will be, dare I say it, the sacrifices and the tithes of the land. In Ezekiel 20, for on my set apart mountain, the mountain on the mountain heights of Yisrael, declares the Master Yah, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, shall serve me. There I shall accept them, and there I shall require your offerings and the first fruits of your offerings together with all your set apart gifts. As a sweet fragrance, I shall accept you when I bring you out from the peoples, and I shall gather you out of the lands where you have been scattered, and I shall be set apart in you before the Gentiles. So this is clearly future tense, because we haven't been regathered. So it's going to be fulfilled again. The Yisrael will be there again, bringing the tithes and the offerings. I, I just thought it's a really cool type and shadow and cyclical thing again. Everything's cyclical. And you shall know that I am Yah, and when I bring you into the land of Yisrael, into the land for which I lifted my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. So let's go back. Um, okay, we're now going to move on to Genesis chapter 29. Everyone with me? Am I allowed to move forward? <laughs> cool. And Yaakov moved on and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field and saw three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks and the large stone was on the well's mouth. 
And all the flocks would be gathered there, and when they would roll the stone from the whale's mouth and, the water, and to water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the whale's mouth. So Yaakov said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. And he said to them, Do you know Levan, son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. So he said to them, Is it well? And they said, Well. And see, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. And he said, see, it is still high day. That means the sun was really bright, like near noontime when it's at its hottest. Not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. And when the, but they said, we are not allowed until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we shall water the sheep. This was because a well and water was a commodity, especially in the middle of the desert. So everyone got to have their fair share, basically. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to be when Yaakov saw Rachel, the daughter of Levan, and his, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Levan, his mother's brother, that Yaakov went near and rolled the stone from the whale's mouth and watered the flock of Levan, his mother's brother. Now, this was the same well that Eliezer, Abraham's servant, found Yitzhak's wife, Rebecca, Rivka. We did this Torah portion two weeks ago. It's the same well. And it's just interesting that the, the patriarchs met their wife at the well. There's this thing, Yeshua, he met a woman at the well. And it, it, it's a beautiful type and shadow because she was a Samaritan, which would have been the northern kingdom. So you've got this illusion that... Anyway. <laughs> um, the stone on the well would have been extremely heavy. It wasn't just like, oh, let's move the stone... The, the, well, I'm suggesting he was trying to impress Rachel, actually. You know, being the, the gusto man, like, I'm going to move... Because it took... These stones were huge. We have a type and shadow, though, that it is Yaakov, i.e. Yisrael, that is able to unlock the well to water the sheep. So, what did we say in that Torah portion um, with um, Eliezer at the well? That the well means to see, to be able to see, to make clear, to make plain... And the water is clearly the word, and the sheep are the people. It takes Yisrael, i.e. the true Yisrael, to water the sheep. They're the ones that are able to unlock, to give water to the sheep. It is Yisrael that brings Yeshua and the water of the word to the whole world. And Yaakov kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And when Yaakov told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rivka's son, she ran and told her father. This is almost parallel in the story. The woman runs off, gets her family, and they all come back. It's, there's just literally minor differences. And it came to be when Levan heard the report about Yaakov, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he told Levan all these matters. And Levan said to him, You are indeed my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Levan said to Yaakov, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for naught? Let me know what should your wage be. And Levan had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was lovely of form and appearance. And Yaakov loved Rachel, so he said, let me serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Remember, he, this would have been to pay off the bride price. What does Leah's eyes were weak mean? What does it mean that her eyes were weak, that, that she couldn't see very well? That's, the, it's that. I, I that's the way I've always understood it. I, I don't know if there's like some big significance. You, there is a type in shadow that um, if Jacob is Yisra, if Jacob is a type in shadow of Yeshua, and you've got the the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom won't be able to see very well. That there is that allusion to it, um, but it, it, you're stretching there. Do you know what I mean? It's stretching it. It could just be she couldn't see very well. <laughs> They didn't have glasses back then. That was a problem. Um, but yeah, Yaakov is doing this so that he can pay the bride price. Remember, he's left with nothing. He's not even able to afford to pay the bride price, which is seven years. He has to work for her. And Levan said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. 
So Yaakov served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. It's really nice. <laughs> then Yaakov said to Levan, Give me my wife, for my days are completed, and let me go into her. And Levan gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to be in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Yaakov, and he went into her. And Levan gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a female servant. And in the morning it came to be that, see, it was Leah. So he said to Levan, what is this that you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Levan said, it is not done so in, the, in our place to give the younger before the firstborn. I just, let's stop here for a bit. Um, people would say, how did he not recognize? I mean, yeah, you could say the woman was covered, but he's worked there seven years. And... Um, You'd think he'd know the tone of voice, at least some form of appearance. What is the fact that he was actually drunk? That's well, that's what I'm going to get to. They had a big feast, and he must have been pretty bladdered. That's what I'm saying. He would have been pretty drunk to not be able to... Do... And this is what uh, the ancient Jewish sages say. Uh, and they say that not only was he really drunk, but um, that L Levan conducted everything in his language, not in Hebrew. And that Jacob was just like, oh yeah, it's all good, do you know what I mean? He didn't really fully understand what was going on. Is that true? The whole thing about it being in a different language is a stretch, but the fact that he was drunk, it's, it's inferred, I'd say. Um, he had sex with her, right? Yeah, that's what he, he went into her. Yeah. He, he by doing, by having, by consummating, that's meant they were married. That was what sealed the act. Um... This is why she's now his wife. And we will see that she became his wife because of this. It, it, having sex with someone back then was a very serious thing. You became one flesh. And once that happened, you belonged to that person. You were tied to each other. Man and wife. It, it's, it's covenant. And not to be too graphic, blood would have been shed. Once blood is shed, that's it. It's a blood oath. Um, so yeah from this we can infer that Jacob was pretty drunk um, anyway Laban deceives him it is not done so this way in our place to give the younger before the firstborn complete the week of this one then we give you this one too for the service which you shall serve me still another seven years so this completing the week the, the, wed the wedding feast would go on for a week and you would complete that basically a week of partying and then you would go on. And he says, complete the week for her. And then you can complete the week for Rachel, for Rachel. And then but to do that, you're going to have to serve me another seven years. So that would be like a You could say it's a Shemitah thing. Maybe there's, I, I never thought of a Shemitah connection. Maybe. But write that down. There's maybe something to dig there. And Yaakov did so and completed her week. Then he gave him his daughter Rachel to as a wife. And Levan gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as a female servant. So basically, in two weeks, he ended up with two women. But he'd already worked seven years, then he does the two weeks, and then he has to work another seven years. The second set of seven years is for Rachel, for Rachel, the one that he loved. Fourteen years. And we're going to see that he stayed another six years to earn any type of flock. Twenty years. Um, Yaakov is reaping what he sowed. He is being deceived just as he deceived his family. He deceived his father. He deceived his brother. You reap what you sow. On that, Yeshua says, With what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with the same measure you use, it shall be measured to you. This is why we have to be so careful of how we treat other people. Because if we want mercy, we best give mercy. If we want compassion, we best give compassion. If we're being horrid, sordid people to other people, expect Elohim to deal with us treacherously too. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be led astray. Elohim is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Because he who sows to his own flesh shall reap corruption from the flesh. But he who sows to the Spirit shall reap everlasting life from the Spirit. Uh, I should have included this, but Romans 6 through to 8 tells you that walking in the Spirit is to walk in the Torah. So, sowing in the Spirit, sowing in things spiritual, heavenly. 
Let's go back to the Parsha in Genesis 29. And he also went into Rachel, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Levan still another seven years. And Yah saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. I believe it's, it's because of this situation that Yah... I'm going to get into this whole thing of do not marry your sister. I believe it's because of this that Yah says this, and do not take a woman as a rival to her sister to uncover her nakedness while the other is alive. Now, people will say, oh, well, Yaakov is breaking Torah. Was he given a choice? He was deceived into this situation. He, he didn't willfully do this. And once he consummated, he's consummated. And, and we're going to see what the result of this is. It's going to fracture the family. It's going to cause bitterness. Envy. We'll, we'll see this play out. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, or Reuven. For she said, For Yah has looked on my affliction, because now my husband is going to love me. So already, Leah, is, she's second best, and she knows it. And we're going to see that all she wanted was to be loved. Um, and she conceived again and bore a son, and said, Because Yah has heard that I am unloved, he gave me this son too. And she called his name Shimon. I mean... Imagine that. You're married to someone and they don't love you. Like, and she, she was a, a, a victim, if not more so than Yaakov, because she, she was made to be his wife, his wife, even though she probably didn't want to. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband is joined to me, because I have borne him three sons. So his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I praise Yah. So she called his name Yehuda, and she ceased bearing. In all this time, she still said, Now he will love me, now he will be with me. It's sad. And when Rachel saw that she bore Yaakov no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Yaakov, Give me children, or else I am going to die. She wants children out of envy. Already we've got the wrong motive. And Yaakov's displeasure burnt against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of Elohim, who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? And she said, See, my female servant built her, go into her, and let her bear for me, and let me be built up from her as well. This sounds familiar. This, is it starting to sound familiar, like Yishmael's and stuff? <laughs> So she gave him Bilha, her servant, for, as, as a wife. And Yaakov went into her. And Bilha conceived and bore Yaakov a son. And Rachel said, Elohim has rightly ruled my case and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Sounds more to me like she took matters into her own hands, but hey-ho. So she called his name Dan. And Rahel's father servant, and Rahel's female servant, Bilha, conceived again and bore Yaakov a second son. And Rahel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and I have overcome. So she called his name Naphtali. I mean, think about what that's saying. She's I've overcome you. Her sister is now an opponent. This is just it's so wrong. And it is such a pity because they probably got on just fine before that. Or you know what I mean, within reason. And like she's seeing her sister as someone to overcome. She's trying to one-up. And Leah saw that she had ceased bearing, and she took Zilpah, her female servant, and gave her to Yaakov as wife. So now she's retaliating. And Leah's female servant, Zilpah, bore Yaakov a son. And Leah said, with Gad. So she called his name Gad. And Leah's female servant, Zilpah, bore Yaakov a second son. And Leah said, I am blessed, for the daughters shall call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Um, and Reuben went, okay, now we're going to take like a little detour. It's weird because you have this narrative and then smack bang this little story. And Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found love apples in the field. Um, love apples is mandrakes, for those that want to know. It's, it's a mandrake. And brought them to his mother, Leah. And Rachel said to Leah, Please give me of your son's love apples. But she said to her, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's love apples too? And Rachel said, I mean, can you see this bickering, this fighting? And Leah's really been like, she knows that she's been second bested. Would you, know, would you now take away my son's love apples? And Rachel said, Therefore, let him lie with you tonight for your son's love apples. But just to let you know, um, back then mandrakes uh, were considered aphrodisiacs and they helped with fertility. That's what. 
Hmm? Even the <laughs> Sorry, you were saying? It's a plant. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they used to use the mandrake root for this. Um, um, you can eat the fruit as well. They're, they're, they're edible. Um, I, I should have really put a picture up of one. Um, we'll do that in the break. And when Yaakov came out in the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, do come in to me, for indeed I have hired you with my son's love apples. I mean, I kind of feel sorry for Jacob because his two wives are fighting in between themselves and he's, being, he's essentially being used as property, as a seed bank to, to give them sons. I mean, to them, back then, to have a lot of sons would have been a blessing, but it's just not the right conditions. Do you know what I mean? Where's the love, so to speak? Yeah. Well, yeah, it is. And think, think about the effect this would have had on the children as well. Because it wasn't just them. This would, this would have gone down to the, you know, oh, well, you're unloved and this. And, and he lay with her that night. Um, sons were a blessing back then. He's a man. There, there is that thing. But sons were to be sought after. If you didn't have many sons, if you didn't have posterity, your, your family line died. So Jacob is being blessed in one way, in the misery of having to work 14 years. So there is some blessing, but at what cost? Also back then, to sleep with the servant, this was, um, to have a surrogate mother, this was quite common back then. Women, if, women who couldn't bear, if they were rich, they would take the female servant and the female servant would act as a surrogate. Uh, this was, it was normal back then, actually. Let's keep going. And Elohim listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Yaakov a fifth son. And Leah said, Elohim has given me my hire, because I have given my female servant to my husband. So she called his name Yisuskar. And Leah conceived again and bore Yaakov a sixth son. And Leah said, Elohim has presented me with a good present. Now my husband is going to dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. This implies that he wasn't even living. She wasn't even in the marital tent. She was off to the side. Still. So she's given him four sons, then the two sons from the female servant, and now these two, and she's still not good enough. Think about that. Bad Don Jacob. Well, yeah, and this, this was all Levan's fault, actually. Bear in mind, who did this? Who instigated Levan? And afterwards, she bought a daughter and called her name Dina. And Elohim remembered Rachel, and Elohim listened to her and opened her womb. She finally gets some children. And she conceived and bore a son and said, Elohim has taken away my reproach. Back then, if you, didn't give, if you couldn't give birth, you were deemed cursed. The woman would have been looked as cursed by everyone else. Like, what sin did you do? Why have you had your womb shut up? What's, what did you do? So she called his name Yosef and said, Yah has added to me another son. This is really a sad story full of jealousy, bitterness, and competition between two sisters. Um, Leah just wants to be loved and is clearly second best. She's trying, and Jacob's like, nah, I want your sister. This is reminiscent of Sarah's and Hagar's relationship. Um, Sarah was the one loved, but Hagar was just basically a surrogate. And there was tension between them two women. Lots of tension. I mean, Sarah abused Hagar. She, she treated her harshly. Now, and I said this earlier, imagine the impact this would have had on the children. Like, my dad doesn't even love my mum. We see this happening a lot today. How does that fa fare out? Not very well. We have children that don't know how to be men, and so forth. It, this is why it's so important for man and wife to be one, to be a had, and to be strong and to love one another. Do we have another wife, someone or something that makes Elohim feel second best? We know that we're, in the spiritual picture, we're supposed to be betrothed unto Elohim and him only. Do we have other things? Does Elohim feel like, you don't love me? You should be loving me, but you love your pet doctrine. You love your religious system, you, whatever. Insert the blank, your idol. Everyone with me? Cool. Uh, let's go to Genesis 31. 
And then he heard the words of Levan's son saying, Yaakov has taken away all that was our father's. And from what belonged to our father, he has made all this wealth. So we're now six years after the 14 years. We've got the first seven years, he marries the two women, works 14 years, and then we're going to find out he worked another six years. So we're now 20 years ahead of when he first left. And Yaakov would look at the face of Levan and see that it was not toward him as before. And Yah said to Yaakov, return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I am with you. And Yaakov sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock and said to them, I see your father's face that is not toward me as before, but the Elohim of my father has been with me. And I know that I have served your father with all my strength. We're going to see that Levan wasn't exactly the nicest employer. And yet, Yaakov served him with all his strength. Not half-heartedly, but with everything. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But Elohim did not allow him to do evil to me. When he said this, the speckled are your wages. He's talking about sheep. Then all the flocks bore speckled. And when he said this, the streaked are the wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. This will make more sense as we go further forward. So Elohim has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. Um, And it came to be at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and looked in a dream and saw the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked and speckled and mottled. And the messenger of Elohim spoke to him, spoke to me in a dream, saying, Yaakov, and I said, here I am. Let, let's hold him. I didn't include this, but basically the way that Yaakov got the flock, his flock, he said, uh, Laban said, what do you want your wage to be uh, for working? Um, and Yaakov said, give me all the streaked and all the spotted sheep so that when it comes to me wanting to leave you cannot say that i have stolen your sheep because my sheep should all be streaked and flocked and yours should be white and what levan does he goes okay so he takes all of his flock all the streaked and all the speckled ones and he moves them away so basically yaakov's got no sheep he moves them three days journey so what happens when Yaakov sees that the sheep are mating, when the strong ones are mating, he does this thing about putting sticks here and sticks there. And basically, streaked and speckled sheep come out from white sheep. And then when, the, when they're weak, he doesn't, he doesn't put the rods there. So basically, all the streaked and speckled sheep that were being born were all the strong ones. And then all the weak ones were Laban's. And that's how Jacob, even, the, you know, even though Laban took all of the streaked and speckled away, Yaakov was somehow able, and now we know that it was the messenger of Elohim that, will, that gave him this idea. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flock are streaked. The leaping on the flock is this euphemism for being the strong ones. Are streaked, speckled and mottled, for I have seen all that Levan is doing to you. I am the El of Betel where you anointed the standing column and where you made your vow to me. We just, we just read this earlier. Who was at the top of the ladder? It said, Yah Elohim. And now the messenger is saying, I am the El of Beta, where you anointed the standing column and where you made a vow to me. Interesting. Now rise up, get out of this land and return to the land of your relatives. And Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are we not reckoned to him as strangers? For he has sold us and also entirely consumed our silver. So when in bridal talks, when uh, the, the man gave the bride price to the father, it was common practice for the father to actually give a lot of that money back to the bride so that she had some money and if a father kept all the money to himself he was known amongst all his uh, peers as tight-fisted and harsh basically and here we see basically Levan is treating his daughters as a way of getting lots of money and he keeps all the inheritance he, he, he consumes our silver the bride price for all the wealth which Elohim has taken from our father are ours and our children's. Now then, do whatever Elohim has told you. 
So Yaakov rose and put his sons and his wives on camels, and he drove off all his livestock and all his possessions which he had acquired, his property of the livestock which he had acquired in Padan Aram to go to his father Yitzhak in the land of Canaan. Now, so Jacob leaves in haste, and he doesn't tell Levan what he's done. He just leaves because he knows that Levan won't let him go. So he leaves in secret. And three days later, Laban's like, what's going on? So he goes and he chases him. The, and this is now Jacob talking to Laban, saying, this is why I've left. Because Laban's saying, why did you do this to me? Why have you betrayed me? And this is what he says back. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your sheep. That which was torn by beasts I did not bring to you. I myself bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was. By day the heat consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep fled from before my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. Unless the Elohim of my father, the Elohim of Abraham, and the fear of Yitzhak had been with me, you would have now sent me away empty-handed. Elohim has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rendered judgment last night. So Yaakov worked 14 years for Rachel. We read that. Six more years for the flock. Laban's changed Yaakov's wages ten times. Yaakov could have easily played the victim. Like, oh, woe is me, I can't do this. But he didn't. He didn't gripe, he just got on with it. 20 years of hard labour, he just got on with it. And he bore the losses of the flock. The messenger of Elohim showed him how to prosper within oppressive work. He didn't go, I'm going to magically take you out and have at it and you can sit on your laurels and have everything fall out of heaven. No, he's like, you're in a hard situation between a rock and a hard place, but I'm going to show you how to prosper within this. Yah expects us to work just as he did. In Genesis 2, 1 to 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their array. And on the seventh day Elohim completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. But Yeshua answered them, My father works until now, and I work. By the way, I'm not talking about employment. Employment's like the very... I'm talking about work for Yah's kingdom. Like the road, the path, the narrow walk. Work is kind of part, but I'm, I'm hinting at the bigger picture. Um, how, okay, so we're going to see what Yah says about people. I'm, I'm getting to the point of laziness. Um, this, we have, in modern society, we have this self entitled attitude where the world owes me something, and when anything gets difficult, well, I don't, I'm not going to do this because this is difficult and this is unfair. Oh, this is unfair. What Jacob went through was unfair. He didn't gripe. He just worked solid. He grafted. Now, this is what scripture has to say about people that are the opposite of this. How long would you lie down, O lazy one? When do you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to lie down, and your poverty shall come like a prowler, and your need as an armed man. This idea of, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. Poor is he who works with a lazy hand, but the hand of the hard worker makes him rich. Did Jacob work hard? You bet. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Um, This would have brought shame upon the father and the mother. You know, this gets back to this thing um, about the stoning children of uh, when the people bring the son to the elders and they say my son is he's, a, he's lazy he's a glutton he's a drunkard he just sits on his laurels all day and it brings shame to the family as vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes so is the lazy one to those who send him i mean <laughs> it's just so graphic The being of the lazy one craves but has not while the being of the hard worker are enriched The way of the lazy one is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the straight is a highway. This idea of this, I think it goes further. This will be eluded, but um, this idea, if you're lazy, you're not willing to clear the thorns. Like, anyway. 
Also, he who is slack in his work is a brother of a master destroyer. <whistles> doing things half-heartedly or not doing them properly or doing half a job. We have this saying, alpha. All right, alpha. You did half a job and you actually end up, it's a play on words, half, alpha, alpha. Um, and um, it, you, you, it, when I've been at work and someone does half a job, it actually creates more problems for everyone else. It's like, just, just stop. Just stop what you're doing. You're making it worse. Laziness makes one fall asleep, fall into a deep sleep, and an idle being suffers hunger. This adds a new light, actually, to being the spirit of deep sleep, I thought. Uh, a lazy one buries his hand in a dish and does not bring it back to his mouth. It's this, he's been like extravagant. Like he, he, can, he can't even pick up his own food to feed himself. This is someone who won't help themselves. You see this a lot. Um, people just like, they say, oh, I need help. But then you go to help them. They don't want to do anything. The lazy one does not plow after the autumn. At harvest time, he inquires, there is none. This, you get this idea of people wonder why nothing's going right. Well, you're not doing anything about it. Do you know what I mean? And this guy, imagine the picture. He's not plowed and he's expecting to find something and he's surprised. Oh, there's nothing there. By the way, I'm not talking about work as in go get a job. I'm talking about the work of the kingdom and your attitude and how are you with people. Like Laziness is not about work. It's about how you live. It, 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 it's multiple levels. I'm, what I'm trying to say, it's not just about that. But it, it, it's part of it. Um, the desire of the lazy man slays him, for his hands refuse to work. He covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not withhold. You, you see this, um, I, I, I'm going to be politically incorrect. The people that don't deserve the dole, um, they openly admit that I'm not going to work. I can work, but I don't want to because it's easier. To, you know what I'm talking about? And what do they, they cover. They want all these things, even though they can't have them. Well, if you want them, do something about it. If you want something, not even physical, if you want an outcome in your life, what are you willing to do to get to that outcome? Jacob worked 20 years. The lazy one says, there is a lion outside. I'm going to be killed in the streets. Making excuses. Like, the lazy one says, there is a lion in the way. A fierce lion is in the streets. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy one turn in his bed. <laughs> I like that. The lazy one buries his hand in a dish. It ties him to bring it back to his mouth. The, again, it can't be bothered to even help yourself. And this idea of so does the lazy one turn in his bed is endless, endless. Round and round you go. The lazy one is wiser in his own eyes than seven rendering advice. Wow. You see this a lot. They think they know it all. Like, you see it in uh, football. You have all these people, these lager louts, drinking, going, oh, the manager needs to do this and he needs to get that player. Da, 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 da. It's like, what do you know? You're a lager lout and you drink beer in a pub. You, you think you know everything, but, and they think that they're wiser than seven people giving true advice. You see this playing out all the time. So that was my point. Yeah, exp this, the way to life is hard pressed. We read this last week that it's tribulation, there's pressing. If you are lazy, you're, you're not going to go through that. You're not going to be willing to go through it and to deal with it under oppression. Jacob could have easily gone, I've had enough. You're screwing me over. And he would have been righteous to do so, but where would they have got him? Poor, he wouldn't have had a flock, and he, he wouldn't have completed his service to Laban for the women. He had the promise from the blessing. Well, yeah, he, even had the, he could have said, I'm yeah, thank you. He had the heavenly blessing of Abraham. I don't need to do anything. It's going to fall out the sky into my pocket. It, the point I'm trying to see, say is that um, we have a lot of, uh, not like ba uh, backseat drivers, but bedside believers, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. A lot of believers that are not willing to put the hard work in to change their character, that are not willing to submit to authority. Because let's face it, it's hard work submitting to Yars Will sometimes. 
Some things are easy for some people, but there's some things like, you know, like greed, lust. And I'm not talking about sexual lust, wanting stuff. How about curbing your anger? How about changing that nature so that you don't have a filthy mind? That takes hard work. Are we willing to put the effort in to conform to the image of his son? That, this is what I'm really trying to get at. We have a lot of believers saying, I keep the Torah, I'm good. But they're not willing to do the hard work that goes on on the inside. Keeping Shabbat is easy. Tithing is easy. Not going to work, not eating pork is easy. What about conforming your heart and circumcising your heart? Is that, no, that's difficult. And we have a lot of people, they're doing the mechanical stuff, but not the inner stuff. They are being lazy. Okay, let's, uh, I'm going to finish on this section. Looking good. I'm going to cover Laban. And the t- let's look at Laban. I, I said this a couple of weeks ago. Laban means white in Hebrew. It literally means white. Um, white is a symbol of righteousness. In Isaiah 1.16, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek right ruling. Reprove the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says Yah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you submit and obey, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of Yah has spoken. So righteousness, doing right, is considered being white. Does Laban fit this picture of righteousness, or is it a facade? We've just seen all the stuff he did. Uh, we read this, now this is, do you remember when Eliezer went to get the wife? We read this, and Rivka had a brother whose name was Levan. Levan ran, ran out to meet the man to the fountain, and it came to be when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets of gold on the sister's wrist, and then when he heard the, all the words, then he says, come in, O oh blessed of Yah. What did he, he saw the riches, he's like, he's blessed, I want a bit of that. And then we just read this. Give me my wife, for my days are completed. Let me go into her. And we know what happens. Yaakov got given Leah instead by treachery. Um, it is not done in this way. Like you can imagine saying, well, it's not done. You should have known. Don't you know? He was deceiving Jacob. Complete. And why? Because he wanted another seven years. That's why he did it. He's thinking, this guy's working good. I'm being blessed by this. And his service is up. Oh, I know, I can get him to work another seven years for me if I deceive him with the wife. Because he, he, he knew he would have gone for Rahel anyway. He knew he would have put the work in. That's why he did it. He wanted another seven years of free labour. Manipulation, yeah, manipulation, witchcraft, it is. And w- what did we read about Jacob that he served with all his strength? Laban didn't want to lose that. And we read this earlier. And Yaakov said to Rahel and Leah into the field... Uh, I see your father's face. It's not with me as before. You know that I've served him in all my strength. Yet your father, he's deceived me and changed my wages ten times. Uh, and we read this. He, so when, um, when he said the speckled are your wages, clearly speckled sheep came out. So he's like, no, 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 no. Okay, now the striped are your wages. They started coming out striped. He kept changing it because he was greedy. He was a, a, the picture of greed. Uh, these 20 years I have been in your house, I served you 14 years, 6 years for your flock, you've changed my wages 10 times. And then he says, if it wasn't for Elohim, you would have sent me out empty handed. I know what you're like, I've been with you 20 years. And late, look, listen to this, this is the cheek. Laban answered and said to Yaakov, these daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock, and all that you see is mine. He's literally saying... He's implying that this is all mine. It came from me. But we know that Laban at some point agreed, this is your wages. And then he changed the wages. No, this is your wages. And it's this idea of, well, it's mine, don't you know? He doesn't even see how how greedy he is. he's, He's drunk on it, you could say. But what shall I do today to these, my daughters, or to their children whom they have born? Um, I just want to mention, he says, these are my daughters. What did his daughters say about him? They didn't think that he, they were his daughters. They said, well, he sold us and he consumed all our silver. So clearly he didn't really care. Um, 
And Rachel and Leah answered him, Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are we not reckoned to him as strangers? So much for them being daughters. Do you know what I mean? It, ridiculous. Yaakov proceeds to leave with his family and his goods. And when Levan had gone to shear the sheep, now we're going to see, I'm going to build a picture on Laban. So now I'm trying to show what his character was like. Now we're going to see why he even chased Jacob in the first place. It wasn't because of the daughters or wanting to send them away. We'll see why. When Levan had gone to shear the sheep, Rachel stole the house idols that were her father's. And then we, further on we see, and Levan said to Yaakov, what have you done that you have deceived me and driven my daughters off like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not inform me? And I would have sent you away with joy and songs and with tambourine and a lyre, and you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have been foolish to do this. It is in the power of my hand to do evil to you. But the Elohim of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Guard yourself that you do not speak to Yaakov, either good or evil. And now you have gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my mighty ones, the things that Rachel stole? That's why he came all the way back. Not be- He gave it all this, oh, I wanted to say, but I want- where's my idols? That's what he finishes. This is the main point of why he even chased Jacob. The idols are what Levan was really after. We have a man whose name means white that would appear to serve Yah because he knew who Yah was, come in, O blessed of Yah, but also worships idols, syncretism, taking, mixing the holy and the profane. He was doing both. In Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are filled with plunder and unrighteousness. Blind Pharisee, clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside of them becomes clean too. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly indeed look well, but inside are filled with dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Laban is the picture of that. So you two outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. We have a picture of Yaakov living in Babylon with people who appear righteous, but are full of wickedness, idolatry and hypocrisy. Does it sound familiar? When Yaakov leaves, Levan thinks that he is the one who is right. Laban genuinely thought he was in the right. This idea that you're not able to see. Uh, So, anyway... Interestingly, one of Yaakov's wives brings back the, the idols of Babylon with her in her journey towards the land of promise. I believe this is hugely prophetic because we have believers who come to truth are not letting go of their idols, of their baggage, of their ideologies, of their past ways. They bring in. This is why you get messy Baptist, messy Costal, messy add in the blank. You know, you get people that. They speak Torah, they they keep the commands, they wear tzitzit and they blow all the Judaica and all of this, but they haven't changed. All they've done is change the days, the names and what they eat. But they're still the same people. And this is what I'm saying, like, this is a picture of the bride supposed to be coming out of Babylon and she brings Babylon with her. We need to let go of Babylon. I hope that's been a blessing. I know there's been quite a few sort of topics. We've covered, you know, Yeshua being the ladder to heaven. We've covered don't be lazy. And we've covered basically hypocrisy. People that appear to know Yah and they look righteous, but they're not. I hope that's been a blessing.